Yeah, now you can see on YouTube. I see. Okay, so now we can start. Good afternoon, one and all. I am Ramajur Maori, a faculty in the Department of Physics, NIT Kalikat. As a convener, I humbly welcome you all in the today's webinar on astrophysics. It is my great pleasure to welcome today's uh, webinar speaker, Dr. Nikhil Mukund from Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics. Webinar chairperson, Professor Ragusar, our uh, head of the department, Dr. Raji sir, respected colleagues from uh, physics and other departments of my institute. My dear students, you are most welcome in the today's webinar on astrophysics. Uh, many of you have already attended previous webinars on astrophysics. Uh, those were related to Nobel Prize in Physics last year. We had a very interesting and informative talks by our webinar speakers, Dr. Bisal from PRL and my colleague, Dr. Bala. There were several interesting questions by our audience. If I remember correctly, both talks lasted for around one hour, but uh, questions and answer sessions lasted for another half an hour. So I hope you will enjoy the today's webinar in the same way. Uh, briefly, I want to tell you how this webinar was initiated. After the webinar on Nobel Prize in Physics last year, uh, Burma sir suggested me to contact uh, Dr. Nikhil our first BTEC engineering physics batch alumni for a webinar. So when I asked him for a webinar, he gladly accepted my request. So after that, we met few times to finalize the event. So Dr. Nikhil, thank you very much for accepting my request for the webinar. My pleasure. Yeah. Uh, a message for those people who are joining us on YouTube. You can post your doubts related to today's talk on the YouTube itself. We will try to take your questions. So now, without uh, any delay, let me invite uh, today's webinar uh, chairperson, Professor Raghu sir, to conduct the webinar. Sir, please. Thank you, Ram. I hope I'm audible to all. Um, it's a great, great pleasure to have one of our students uh, back here talking to us about the work he's doing. Um, as uh, Ram was saying, Nikhil uh, is a, a student from our first engineering physics uh, batch uh, in 2009. And I happened to be the faculty advisor to their batch and uh, had very close interactions a uh, wonderful bunch of uh, students uh, they were it was uh, always great and still uh, great memory interacting with them in many ways um nikhil uh, as um, uh, uh, i mean the uh, uh, abstract says nikhil is working uh, right now uh, at the max Planck institute for gravitational physics uh, uh, as a junior scientist uh, uh, researcher and contributes to the commissioning and characterization of the uh, uh, gravitational wave detector there. He is also interested in incorporating machine learning techniques to create smarter detectors with improved uh, data quality and a better overall duty cycle. Um, he, uh, after his engineering physics uh, degree from NIT Calicut, he carried out uh, his uh, PhD uh, studies at the Ayuka uh, between 2013 and 18. And uh, he was a part of the LIGO scientific collaboration, which detected the first uh, gravitational wave signals uh, in September 2015 using the advanced LIGO detector uh, situated at Livingston and Hanford. And he subsequently worked at the LIGO Livingston. Uh, uh, facility as a fellow for about a year and uh, moved to Hanover in uh, 2019. 
he is also an nts scholar um uh, he um, i remember him coming uh, various times to meet me on various issues and uh, he was um, one who was very well uh, uh, fixed in his decision to do a phd in india and uh, which i found very uh, different from the others in his batch uh, who were very keen to go out and so uh, that was a that's something very characteristic about nikhil and uh, uh, it's as i said a great pleasure to have him here and uh, talk to us and i don't want to take up much more of uh, the time here uh, let's then uh, hand over to nikhil nikhil thanks sir it, it's my pleasure to talk to all of you it brings back a lot of uh, memories so yeah let's start the presentation uh, so let me try to share my screen i think you will have to enable screen sharing for me okay no yes 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 yeah you can okay yes let me yeah we can see your screen yeah can you see it now yes okay great yeah so it's my pleasure to talk to all of you and it's great to see that many of you are interested in gravitational wave waves and since we have a bit of diverse audience i have sort of modified my slides so that i kind of cover the broad picture but I also focus on some of the key points and my main aim through this lecture of this presentation is to give you a feel how relevant technology technological innovations are and how they contribute to real as uh, scientific discoveries so I, i would like to keep it very informal uh, so if you have any doubt please feel free to add them to the ch chat window and at the end of end of this presentation we will try to address Uh, some of it so let's let's go ahead so the one question that we get asked most of the time is why do you study astronomy and astrophysics i think everyone would have their own answers but i think the simplest one would be just curiosity so if you are if you would like to know how the universe began and or how it is currently working and perhaps how it will move ahead like how it will evolve studying as astronomy and astrophysics is one way to tackle that question and the way we do is like we study star stellar systems and track their evolution we cannot just sun is a good source but we don't restrict ourselves to just studying sun because it takes long time for these systems to evolve typically billions of years so hence what we do is we make use of telescopes in multiple wavelengths starting from radio all the way till uh, gamma ray and then use these devices to capture these stellar systems and try to combine all this and build a picture of how how the universe is how the universe was at different stages of its evolution uh but however like if you look at some of the heavier stars and to see their path of evolution you would see that they might they end up as a neutron star it's a very high dense density uh, yeah star or as a black hole and these objects it's rather difficult to use conventional techniques and conventional electromagnetic radiation to study them so we need different kind of messengers to uh, probe these objects and that's why we want something like gravitational waves and that's the main topic that i want to discuss so let's see so before i discuss uh, gra uh, gravitational waves i would like to mention the general theory of relativity this is a geometric theory of gravity 
that was proposed by Einstein in 1915, and it's a it's it's a because why, why do I say it's a geometric theory? It co compared to Newton's gravity, which you are all familiar. Uh, the way Einstein conceived of how he like the way he proposed gravity is rather uh, shown in this picture where you where you can see that if you, if you have a very massive body like the sun what it does to the space time around it is to curve the space time just like if you have a fabric and if you put a heavy mass object just like how the fabric is deformed similarly the space time is distorted and it's well explained by the statement from john wheeler who says matter tells space how to curve and space tells matter how to move. And so once you have this kind of deformation, uh, the other objects are following this curved path and you see them as moving around. So you'd see that Earth is moving around the sun. In fact, it is just traversing this trajectory. So, and the, the how much distortion it can, like an object can cause uh, depends on its ma mass. And we will see that when you get, get to higher mass objects like sun to neutron stars to black hole, the deformation increases. And to, Einstein gave his very famous field equation, which I show here, which kind of connected the matter distribution and the space-time curvature. So this is a, a sort of nonlinear partial differential equation. But when you solve it, we and we can extract the metric which connects uh, which essentially tells how the space-time behaves at different point in uh, the universe. Okay, so since a picture is worth a thousand words, I will now show a small clip, which is a simulation of two uh, stars, like two neutron stars, and how they interact with each other and how they emit gravitational waves, and which is like essentially losing energy from the system and how they come close to each other. And I would like to tell that this is an audio clip where the frequency that you would hear is, is the frequency of the emitted gravitational waves and the amplitude of the audio is scaled uh, corresponding to the amplitude of the emitted gravitational waves. So here you would see the two objects and below you would see the emitted gravitational waves. Tell that this is an audio clip where the frequency that you would hear So you would notice, like if you had a keen ear, you would notice that the frequency was increasing with time and the amplitude was also increasing with time. This is very characteristic of gravitational wave signals and we call it chirp signals. And I would also like to mention that you don't want to be near these events because they release an energy equivalent to you know, few times the mass of sun. Okay, so it's a very violent explosion happening in the universe. But fortunately, these ha events happen very far from us. And so if, if you look at this graphics, uh, I, I hope you can see my pointer. Uh, so you, so, if, uh, so if, if the signal, is ha uh, if the event happens somewhere here, our Earth and the gravitational wave detectors are located far away. And as the wave propagates, it gets attenuated. And by the time it reaches Earth, it is so attenuated that the distortion is, I don't know, few orders of magnitude smaller than the atomic nucleus. So it's a very, very tiny vibration that we would like to pick up to. And why do you like to, why do you want to pick it up? Because if we see it, it's a proof that Einstein's theory of gravity is real and it's, it can be validated. So that's like the motivation to detect this. But when Einstein figured out the magnitude of what we can see, he 
thought it's impossible to do it probably because technology at that time was less sophisticated but experimentalists were hopeful and since the 1960s there have been a lot of efforts to build devices to sense these signals and when when we come to the far field zone which is far away from the source it turns out that you can decompose the space time metric perturbation in terms of the flat background space time and the extra perturbation and if we solve einstein's equation in this linearized regime it turns out in, if you put this back into the equation and solves solve it it turns out that it has a form very similar to the wave equation and the plane wave solution to this wave equation in metric perturbation is what we call as gravitational waves okay so and yeah and in the right gauge like uh, in the transverse and traceless gauge we can see that they have two degrees of uh, freedom or two polarizations and yeah so let me go to the next slide and essentially we are trying to detect this metric perturbation through the devices uh, here so experiment like when we want to design an experiment you would be interested in seeing what physical effect can we expect from these events okay how does it interact with matter and what sort of effect can i expect so that okay so if i i would like you to imagine a ring of a uh, ring of particles in the plane of this slide okay and if you if you can imagine a gravitational wave passing through the slide like perpendicular to this plane the effect that it would cause is to stretch these particles in one dimension like one axis at the same time it would stretch squeeze the particles in the other axis okay and then in the other half cycle it 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 uh, repeats but in but what happens is like the particles who got stretched gets squeezed and the other ones are uh, stretched back so this kind of stretching and squeezing is the kind of motion that you expect when a gravity wave, gravitational wave is passing through uh, earth so we can essentially see that these events are causing strain uh, in the space time and what is strain strain is defined as the change in length by the original length okay and we know from calculations that this value of strain expected from these events are very very minute uh, but and our goal is to detect them but we already know that through michelson interferometers we can detect changes in length so we can detect this quantity uh, but we know that the strain is too small so to have a measurable signal it makes sense to increase the length okay so that the so that the signal is strong enough so this is the motivation to building large scale interferometers which is typically few kilometers long but you could ask why restrict them to few kilometers why not 100 kilometers that's a tricky thing because there are various reasons uh, some of which is like these are expensive devices and we have to maintain ultra high vacuum so it's hard to build and maintain these devices and the other one is to acquire land we need like a lot of land to construct this and the other one is other reason is like the earth's curvature also ha- comes into account if we if we go for like hundreds of kilometers so that's why we restrict to few kilometers and then we make use of certain tricks to enhance the sensitivity so that's the key idea so <laughs> now let me show again a video i'm sure many people have who have listened to at least one gravitational wave lecture they must have encountered this video uh, so to keep them engaged i would i would just ask them to think about these two questions and to the rest i will explain this uh, graphic so what is a michelson interferometer and how can we explain its sensitivity to gravitational waves so what we have is we have a laser source of uh, say 3 watt and we use it at infrared so uh, 1064 nanometers and then essentially we have a beam splitter 
which is a 50-50 beam splitter, which splits the beam and then sends it into perpendicular directions. And then we have, we keep highly reflective mirrors, which reflect the beam back. Okay, and when they come back and come here, uh, depending on the phase relation and depending on the length, uh, they interfere constructively or destructively. And then, and the, after the interference, the light comes out and we detect it with a photodiode. So let's watch it in action. The beam goes, comes back, interferes, and when there is a gravitational wave, it would stretch, stretch and squeeze the space-time, and we should be able to uh, detect these length changes through the changes in the interference. Okay, so when the wave, gravitational wave passes, it causes these distortions, which change the interference pattern, which change the light, which is coming out, and which is impinging the photodiode. So essentially, we are looking at the photodiode signal, and we isolate our optics from every other possible noise source. And then we hope that the incoming gravitational wave will cause these kind of signals, and we read it out. So this is the basic uh, principle. So one technical thing, so where should we operate? So should we operate at the dark fringe, which is where we have perfect uh, destructive interference, or should we operate at the uh, constructive interference we have the where we have the maximum light coming out? So it turns out you cannot operate here uh, at the maximum because your photodiodes get saturated with the light. And you cannot operate at the dark fringe because there is no signal coming out. So traditionally, all the detectors apply an offset, and the operating point is slightly shifted from the uh, destructive interference. So now let us. Uh, let, so I'll describe the ideal world, where. Okay, so let's see. So in the ideal world, we have the source, the star systems, which are like 500 around 500 megaparsecs away, and they are emitting these gravitational waves. And then we have our interferometers, which I represent with this graphic. And they, when they interact, they change the photodiode signal, which is detected by these low noise photodiodes. And then we should be able to, with some amount of fairly significant amount of data analysis, uh, we should be able to see the signal from the photodiode. Okay, so essentially, if something happens here, it should reflect. So this is a this is a time segment, one second segment, and you can see it's in strain because that's how, how it affects matter. And this is the unit, so it's ten raised to minus twenty two, and an atom nuclear system raised to minus fifteen, so it's tiny. And this is how we would see in the ideal world where there is only gravitational wave. Uh, and I also like to represent them in this as an image like this, where I show the time on one axis and the frequency on the other axis. So what happens is as the signal is passing through us, its frequency is increasing uh, with time. Okay, so that's why we see this characteristic chirp signal. Okay, so now let's add some amount of reality. So in the real world, we have noise sources and that can and noise, when I say noise, it's it's anything which is non-astrophysical, which ultimately changes the length of the interferometer, the path length, or it can cause phase changes in the light. Okay, so it can cause length or phase change. And one source of noise, the most prominent noise at high frequency, is called is the readout noise at the photodiode, and it's called photon short noise. So this noise arises because when we look at the arrival time of photons at the photo detector, they, it seems a bit random, and they seem, seem to follow certain statistics called Poisson statistics. And this randomness in the arrival time of photons lead to a so, so, sort of uncertainty and a noise. So if we go uh, back and forth, so I would like, you can see this, is, this was the original signal and how it is getting corrupted at the high frequency. Okay, so uh, I see. So I yeah. So is that it? Like, do we have other sources? Of course. And the other major 
for noise that can change path happens at the lowest frequency and that is primarily the ground motion so we expect our uh, earth to be like quiet but it's if you use a seismometer you would see that it's moving at 10 raised to minus 7 so you should uh, i was talking about 10 raised to minus 22 and the ground is moving at 10 raised to minus 7 at 1 1 hertz okay and that if you again look back uh, between these two signals you can see that how i now see extra modulations coming and how my signal is getting corrupted so this is not gravitational wave this is just ground motion so and if you are really lucky or unlucky someday this is like the geo interferometer where i am currently live streaming this video from and this is the center station and this is one of the arms the other arm is this way you might see we might have some unexpected guests like this we have some tractors coming to be farming we can see that they are right they are working just next to our corner end station like our corner station and you will see that our signal is completely corrupted okay and these they cause so significant amount of ground motion that uh, they cause so significant amount of ground motion that the whole interferometer goes out of lock okay so uh, so it's not just corrupting the data but it's also hard to keep the whole thing under control but we do have good knowledge about the seismic noise and the different kind of seismic noise so they they are primarily earthquakes at the lowest frequency and typically at ligo and other detectors there are some amount of activity going on to mitigate so right now the, it's hard to shield against earthquakes so there is kind of no isolation in the future we are planning to use machine learning to get early warning of these earthquakes and switch the configuration of our detectors so if you go to higher frequency i have micro seismic motion this is from the oceans so if the weather is bad uh, the ground starts vibrating at a different higher frequency and this is typically controlled by using active platform isolation okay that means i can place sensors at various places around my detector and see how much the ground is mo moving and then feed it back to my system and engage feedback feed forward controls to stabilize the optical platform to the platform here yeah. and sometimes we get wind like today geo we cannot lock the interferometer and if you look behind me you would see some of the cavities flashing that's because of the wind it's hard to maintain lock and still yeah at ligo we they use advanced controls to mitigate this and then at the highest frequencies we have human induced noise which is traffic and stuff like that mining traffic like that that's one motivation to construct these interferometers at very quiet location okay so that so because of all these noises we need an extra loop to mitigate their effect so what we do usually is like we sense how much extra noise or extra motion is happening at the lowest frequencies through this photodiode and then we use a lot of active uh, we use a lot of control co control systems which is, which includes both analog and digital filters and they acquire signal from different sensors placed within the interferometer and with proper design of filters we can actually send feedback signals so they are essentially trying to sense the motion and then trying to push the mirror in the opposite direction so that only like the the seismic noise or the non astrophysical noise is minimized okay so that's how the control systems work and usually it's done through coil magnet coil magnets where you so you essentially send a current creates uh, fields and then it can actuate on the mirror at the top stage and at the bottom stage we might have we use electrostatic force uh, to control the mirror and this kind of uh, this sort of uh, feedback helps to keep our interferometer in locked condition and when i say lock i mean 
to uh, maintain the position of each of these optics such that I achieve resonance in my system. And if you look carefully, you would see that I, I am suspending all my optics through these uh, wires, or fibers, and you might wonder why, why am I doing that. So it turns out that the most simplest and way to isolate vibration is to suspend an object. So if you can imagine a simple pendulum, and, and if, you are if you look at carefully, your home, you would your see that laptop, I, I am suspending all the uh, charger. And then the idea is like, I, I am holding my object. And then I am, I am trying to see if I move the top stage at some frequency, how does my bottom stage respond to it? So I'm looking at this transfer function. At each frequency, I'm trying to move the top stage and see how much motion is happening at the lowest stage. It turns out that at the lowest frequency, when I move this mirror, it is completely transmitting the motion. So there is no shielding. It just uh, repeats what was applied. So there is no isolation. And if I increase my frequency and come here, it's an interesting point, and it will have resonance. That means the object moves like you are injecting more energy into the system and it moves even higher than the injected signal. So you don't want your uh, you don't want such high resonances in your system and usually we damp them through uh, filters. So but when you go to the highest frequency, as I show here, it turns out that the noise is attenuated. So even if you move the stop stage, at very high frequency, by the mere suspension, it gets attenuated and it has a one by F square uh, slope if I have a single stage suspension. So if I look at this transfer function and if I have some amount of motion at one hertz, and by the time I come to 10 hertz, it is attenuated by a factor of 100. So this is good. And what we do at LIGO or Virgo or even here at GEO is to use multiple suspension. So you have multiple stage uh, like this. So you will have one more pendulum and each stage will give you one by F square isolation. So you, we typically have three to four stage. Okay. So that's suspension. So now let me come to this picture again. And this time I have added more real, realistic. I have made it more realistic. Uh, so in the sense that uh, in addition to the gravitational waves and seismic noise, we might also have stray electromagnetic fields that can affect the actuators. You might, and on the sensing side, on the, like, if you look at the face of the electric, uh, of the static carrier, the laser light, it can be affected by the short noise. It can also be affected, affected by scattered light. So if you do a lot of optics experiments, you would know how bad scattered light is. So all this can get into the system. And even with the control systems, we already know that you cannot have perfect controllers and they can inject control noise, a lot of control noise into the system. That, that's why we need good amount of engineering to design very low noise controllers. And even at the actuator, it can also have its own nonlinearities and other sort of noises. So. What we do is like we take into account all, all of these and scientists took very careful design and engineering have come up with very low noise electronics uh, uh, and actuators and things like that. And we make use of such control logic and uh, try to lock the interferometer, minimize the low frequency motion and sense the signal. So I can say that uh, at high frequency, okay, typically above a kilohertz, the photo detector is around, uh, yeah, around a kilohertz. The photo detector, we are actually sensing the gravitational waves, okay? So we just sense, and it's limited by the short noise, while at the low frequency, because I am actuating my system through this uh, feedback, I have actuation signal. And through a process called a calibration, I get a precise understanding of my uh, uh, the optical response. 
and then what we do usually is to uh, record the data both the photodiode signal and the actuation signal and characterize uh, each of these electronics perfectly through calibration process and then reconstruct my gravitational wave signal so at high frequency i directly use this signal and but at low frequency i know that i am act applying my actuation but i can subtract off my actuation signal because i have a precise understanding of what is happening so this is almost close to what is happening and the reconstructed signal would look like the strain signal okay so now let me introduce geo 600 it's a german british gravitational wave detector located in hanover in germany and this is where i work and i am currently live streaming it from here so as you can see it's it is similar to the michelson interferometer that i showed you uh, and it's it's actually uh, 6 600 meters long around this axis and uh, around both the axis around both axes and yeah and this is our center station where we send the laser beam okay and you can see that we have a lot of farming happening close to the site and coming to the site itself is gives you fair amount of exercise because you have to cycle all the way and if something goes wrong here you have to go back <laughs> so it's good as for your health also uh so now let let me show the optics that's inside this okay so it is slightly more complicated than a simple michelson but i am sure i can explain to you in less than a minute so let's see so i start with my main laser but even though i have a good laser and it i might still have the laser frequency off uh, and i only care about the fundamental mode of the laser so we have input mode cleaners to clean the beam and then i'll explain this mirror later we have the usual beam splitter okay we have the beam splitter which splits the signal and we do a trick so we know we are limited by our length and 600 meters and we know we need longer arm length so we fold geo so we keep an extra mirror here and reflect back the beam so in fact we have a length of 1200 meters okay and the beam comes back how inter interfere here and then goes through this mirror i'll explain it later we have certain beam directing optics and then finally the gravitational wave signal is only in the fundamental mode okay so i would like to filter out the extra stuff and because of various effects thermal effects and stuff like that i might have higher order modes and i use an optical uh, i use an output mode cleaner to be uh, to clean the beam and finally it comes to the photo detector so if so you could ask like uh, have we seen gravitational waves so geo sensitivity is lower than the bigger detectors and we have not seen gravitational waves with geo but it has been it geo has pioneered lot of technologies uh, some of which i list here um, and these have been subsequently implemented in the bigger detectors and which ultimately helped in the detection of the gravitational wave signal so geo continues to be a test test bed for technology even for the next generation detectors so if we look inside uh, this is how it might lo it, it looks like so it's a clean room area it's a class 100 clean room area and we uh, let in visitors till here and we have a glass shielding here and we you would see that all the optics is under high vacuum and it's all and the laser beam is all shielded but still you might to prevent any scattered light uh, from affecting our eyes we use protection uh, and and since it's infrared you you don't see the beam so you have to always use uh, eye protection once you are inside and okay so now in this slide i actually show the location of the different detectors so in yellow are the ones which are currently in operation we have kagra in japan geo in germany virgo in italy and ligo in hanford and livingston in the us and we have ligo india under construction 
and how do these interferometers compare in terms of sensitivity so when i say sensitivity i if you look at the y axis it is in units of strain okay and it, it is like it starts from 10 raised to minus 19 and minus goes to 10 raised to minus 24 and i show it in the audio band frequency which is from 10 hertz to around 10 kilohertz so you would see that they differ in their sensitivity for various reasons uh, and one one of it like the some of the contributing factors are like the arm length okay the longer the better and then the amount of light energy stored in the cavity okay and at high at low frequency uh, if you have better seismic isolation you perform better but at the highest frequency that is the primary focus of my lecture my talk uh, you would see that at least they look similar in shape so that means it's the same physics or same noise that is limiting all the sensitivity of all, all these detectors so i would like to talk about some of these noise sources and before i do that i would like to introduce a term called optical gain which essentially say, so if you consider the whole interferometer by this block and if you consider a uh, disturbance in meters your photodiode is essentially sensing something in watt okay and optical gain is just this conversion from watt watt to meters or the other way and one way like suppose i guess or if i know some idea about the noise uh, and i know how to calculate my noise in say in this case short noise uh, measured at the photodiode i would finally would like to project it back to my uh, sensitivity plot and i would like to see how much motion it causes in terms of strain so the way we do is we take the short noise and divide it by the optical gain so essentially from here we get back to here in meters and when you divide it by the arm length you can get the sensitivity in strain and if we see the short noise is like flat in terms of frequency it's a white noise so in terms of frequency it's flat and the optical gain acts like a single pole so it has a 1 by f frequency response so if you divide you will get a shape like this okay qualitatively and if you put it back it kind of matches so in this this is kind of the work that we do we try to guess the source calculate it project it and see that okay i am i know i am limited but i at least know what is limiting me and then we can try to guess or like do some tricks to improve my sensitivity and now i would like to do it quantitatively so as i told you like at high frequency it is the short noise and if i divide by the gain optical gain i get the get it in cent, uh, meter per root hertz and you yeah electronics engineers uh, and know that short noise is given by the short key formula and so which essentially looks at the photo current okay which in turn depends on the impinging power okay and there's a square root so the short noise goes as the root of power and the optical gain which we infer from uh, in the interferometer calibration goes proportional to the power so if you take the ratio you'll see that high frequency sensitivity goes as the root of power so increasing the power uh, increases your short short noise uh, limited sensitivity and if we put in some typical values like you can check it later like uh, if i use this equation and put the current and stuff like that uh, i get 10 raised to minus 11 and if i use an optical gain which is typically inferred from calibration and divide it I, we can already see that the interferometer is very 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 sensitive at 1 kilohertz so it's like around 10 raised to minus 18 meters at, uh, that's that's the source of that's the level of motion that we are able to uh, detect at highest frequency okay so let's see uh, so one key principle that improves the sensitivity of any of these interferometers is to increase the amount of circulating light in the arms okay uh, and as i showed you before the interferometer essentially has a beam splitter and two mirrors and we send a laser beam and we have 
destructive interference happening here. That means very less light is coming out. So we send in say three watt and very less light is coming out. So that means it has to go somewhere. And it turns out if we operate in the dark fringe condition, close to the dark fringe, all this light is reflected back. The beam splitter is acting like a perfect reflector and all the light is coming back to the laser. And we would obviously want to reuse this light. So what we do is to put an extra mirror here. Okay. And that what does that what it does is to reflect back the light and recirculate it in this power recycling cavity. And the gain in power that I obtain by placing this mirror depends on the reflectivity of these mirrors. And typically at geo, we have a factor of thousand enhancement. So that means if I send a laser beam of three watt, I am actually uh, we are actually getting three kilowatt inside. And for comparison, this uh, uh, the laser pointer that we use for presentations, it is just few milliwatt. So it's a lot of power inside, and uh, that's how we increase the sensitivity. But there are some uh, side effects when we have such high amount of uh, circulating power. One is the thermal effects. So if you see the beam is completely passing through my uh, passing through our beam splitter, and this causes thermal distortions, and that leads to higher order optical modes in the system, and this is not a desirable thing. And but at geo, what we do is we try to thermally compensate it by projecting thermal radiation. So if you know what distortion is caused, uh, we can project in the countering. We, we can counter it by projecting thermal radiation and correct for the distortions. That's what we do. And recently there have been a there, there has been a paper which has uh, they have found that because we have such high amount of light passing through a material, it kind of makes this configuration very sensitive to dark matter fields and come and it's even higher than advanced LIGO and Virgo because they have arm cavities and hence they don't have such high light passing through an optics. And I'm not going into the details. I've given the link. You can check it. Uh, okay. So now let me come to the next Next technique. So we know we can improve the stored light and we can improve the static carrier field. What else can we do? So the next thing that improves the sensitivity is to increase the amount of uh, the GW induced optical signal. So we, we want to improve, in, increase the storage time of the GW, uh, the gravitational wave induced signal. So let's see. So what, what does that mean? So when we have these astrophysical events happening and when this uh, waves pass through the interferometer. What they do is to introduce side bands around my main laser frequency. So if I have a carrier frequency, the waves are in the gravitational waves are interacting with it and introducing side bands. Okay, and they are introduced in both the arms and all through this space time, all through the length of the arm. Okay, as I show here, and now, let's see what's the time scale. So if I take a gravitational wave at one kilohertz, that means it will persist in my uh, persist for about uh, milliseconds. Okay. While if you calculate this, if you know the speed of light, and if you calculate the time it takes to enter and do this, uh, exit the system, it is in microseconds. So the interaction is happening in uh, milliseconds while the beam is beam and the side bands that are created are exiting out of my out of this uh, beam uh, here uh, in uh, microseconds so it it is it makes sense to keep a mirror here and 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 such that it is resonant to the side bands and thus resonantly enhance the gravitational wave induced optical signal so that's why uh, we keep a signal recycling mirror here and adjust its position such that it resonates the side bands. Okay, so these are two techniques which are implemented and they were actually pioneered at GEO and they are also implemented in all the big detectors.
Okay, so now let me see. So we uh, are there anything else? So next, uh, scientists think like what else can we do to improve the sensitivity? We've seen power recycling. We have seen signal recycling. What else can we do? Uh, and before that, I would like to, as I mentioned before, our infrastructure is in ultra high vacuum. That's around 10 raised to minus 8 millibar. And the atmospheric pressure is around 1 bar. And there are various reasons why we keep it at such low pressure. Uh, one is to reduce the residual gas, uh, the density fluctuations caused from the residual gas. And we also don't want the laser light, like, to, yeah, we don't want it to interact with particles and stuff like that. Um, but it turns out that even if you remove, okay, okay, before that, this graphic you have now seen a lot of, uh, by a lot of time, but I, I don't know if some of you have noticed this beam. So what is this beam, which seems to go inside the, uh, into the interferometer. So I have this beam, which is getting split, comes back, interferes, comes out. But what is this thing, which is going into the interferometer? So it turns out, even if you have vac ultra high vacuum, and even if you don't have any laser field going in, the electromagnetic field still persists in the vacuum, in the space, but in its ground state. Okay, uh, so that means I, I still have electromagnetic field in its ground state, the, uh, which means that it's a field with zero mean, okay, but it has non-negligible variance, okay. Uh, so these are called vacuum field fluctuations and they are always present and they enter the system. And this is one of the reason, this is one way to explain the short noise. I told you it's re, uh, before that it's short noise is related to the random arrival time of the photons. Uh, but it turns out that we have a more fundamental explanation and it is related to these vacuum field fluctuations. Uh, these fields actually beat with the carrier light that is leaking out when you have the path length variation and the beat signal uh, and the, because of these fluctuations, there is noise introduced in the uh, uh, in the light that enters the photo detector, and that's one way to explain the short noise at high frequency. So, can we do something about it? So, it turns out at this point that quantum mechanics we is is uh, pro is like causing us fundamental limitations to how precise we can do such uh, measurements, okay? And yeah, so if, so one way to explain this is to use this ball and stick picture, where in the classical picture, if I want to show a light field, I would use uh, this vector whose magnitude is the amplitude of the field and the angle that it sub subtends is the face of the field. Okay, so in classical picture, it would be a vector and there is no uncertainty. But if you go to the quantum mechanics world, we would see that it is not the case and the amplitude has an inherent uncertainty and the face also has some uncertainty. And it turns out that there are like certain pairs of observables called complementary observables. It could be position and momentum, amplitude and phase, time and frequency, and they seem to under uh, they seem to be uh, limit like connected through this Heisenberg uncertainty relation, which says that there is a there is a if I precise if I precisely measure one of these uh, variables, one of these complementary observables, I introduce more uncertainty into the other observable. So that means there's a limit up to which you can jointly uh, precisely measure two of these uh, connected observables. That's given by the uncertainty relation. So it means like it, uh, it, it looks like we have hit a wall, like we can't do anything. But if we again look back, like uh, how the interferometers work, we at high frequency, we are actually sensing length motion and ultimately 
we are sensing the differential phase. Okay, so the variable or the readout signal uh, or the observable that we really care at high frequency is the phase. So, and not the amplitude. So, we could then, so what we could do then is if we, we, we could do a squeezing refers to this transformation of this circle, which has equal uncertainty in both both the observables into a state which has minimal uncertainty in one of the quadratures, but it, it has, um, since the area has to be uh, same, it will have increased uncertainty in the other quadrature. But in our case, we only care about phase. So what we do is like, we can squeeze the phase. Okay, so what we implement at GEO is very precise and uh, like through high amount of optical engineering, uh, scientists here are able to squeeze the vacuum fields, or the phase, uh, phase squeeze the vacuum fields, and instead of just uh, letting in random field vacuum fields enter, these engineered squeezed fields, which are like locked uh, with the main laser beam, are sent in into the dark port, and these interact with the beam coming out and beat and but it it's because we have precise knowledge about the phase it kind of reduces the short noise sensitivity so if we look at the geo layout and this is it and this would be the corresponding sensitivity and then if we introduce this extra optics and we use optical parametric amplification and inject phased sque phase squeezed vacuum into this we would see an improvement in the in the sensitivity by a factor of 2 and geo is the detector with the highest level of squeezing currently we have 6 db squeezing which is equivalent to factor of 2 and this is same as increasing the circulating laser power by a factor of four. So by this technique, we kind of overcome the thermal distortions that would be otherwise caused if you have high power, uh, and but still achieve the desired amount of sensitivity. And if you have a factor of two sensitivity in amplitude, that means in the volume, it goes as cube of this. And so you will have a factor of eight in the volume that you are probing. So that means we are more sensitive to astrophysical sources. Uh, so this is a key technology for the next generation detectors. And after advanced LIGO and Virgo, there are plans to build uh, the next generation, the third generation. They are called as Einstein Telescope. Uh, it will be built in Europe and Cosmic, Cosmic Explorer in the US and in the mid 2030s. And they plan to achieve 10 dB of squeezing. Okay, so uh, yes, so this is also another interesting thing, and we recently published this in uh, PRL, so you can you can go and check the details. I see. So now, after all this technological innovations and tricks uh, and engineering, we are able to finally detect. We by when I say we, we mean I mean the LIGO scientific collaboration and the LIGO and Virgo detectors are finally able to detect gravitational waves. And after 100 years, uh, after Einstein predicted them, the, these interferometers are seeing these signals, these tiny distortions in space-time. And they kind of precisely match with what Einstein predicted. So hence proving that the general theory of relativity is right uh, and up to a certain, certain level. Okay, so I would say the work, the weight, uh, the weight for these signals was truly uh, worth the. Yeah, it was worth. Uh, so if uh, you are from NIT, you would remember this uh, caption. It's called "Worth its weight in gold." And currently, we see we have seen around thir thirty-nine events. And uh, when the detectors were operational, uh, the advanced by LIGO and Virgo, they were seeing around six events per month. 
Okay, and if you look at these two, so here I show how to uh, object like this objects combine and form a resulting black hole. And if you look at the mass, there would be a difference in the sum and here, and that's emitted as a gravitational waves. And yeah, so it was truly worth uh, all the effort, all the uh, engineering and uh, all the technological innovations finally helped us prove Einstein's theory. And I, yeah, I'm almost at the last slide. We maybe would have this uh, doubt that is it uh, like is this the end? Like, have we seen everything? No, that's not true. Like, we ha this is just the beginning. This is just like Einstein when Galileo built his tele built the telescope. That, that that just ushered in a new era of astronomy. So this is just the beginning, and there are still signals which we have not seen. And so, for one one example that I would like to show is this graphic which again shows these star systems merge, coming together, merging, and finally becoming a single uh, single black hole. And there are various phases to these signals. And there are certain parts uh, which, I, which I would like, like it's called post-merger, which carries a lot of astrophysical information uh, in terms of the uh, inherent equation of state of the neutron star and the magnetic field in the neutron star. And, uh, they determine the shape of this spectral, the shape of these peaks, the frequency and the width. Uh, these have not yet been seen by the any of the interferometers, and there would be a, uh, a effort, increased effort, to target these uh, signals. And I would like to now, sh and yeah, so I would like to now show a demo. We have enough time. Uh, let me stop my screen share and. Sharing your screen, stop staring. Let me share. Okay. I hope you are able to see my uh, window. So what? This is like a hypothetical scenario. Like if we have our okay detector. Okay. So first, let me uh, let me just have no squeezing. Okay, so the blue curve represents uh, the sensitivity of geo. And so what we do is like, we model the sensitivity, given our understanding of the system and the optical parameters, uh, we can actually tune in and model it. So in this case, I know my signal recycling uh, transmittance. Okay, it's like around 10, 10% 10 transmission. I know the circulating power, it's around three kilowatt. Uh, I know we have, so you see it's already here and like this. And then I have, if I put the six BB of squeezing, okay, you would see that my model sensitivity kind of matches with what I really see. So this at the high frequency, because I'm only modeling the short noise part. And this sort of effort, happens all the time to have a better understanding and to be, and to also design uh, new detectors. So if someone would like to target this post-merger signal, uh, can uh, one, before we build, we would try to optimize the various parameters and then try to see if I can capture this signal. So one way would be to increase the power, but then you would, as I told you before, it will have optic, uh, thermal effects and my and the thermal distortions and optical uh, higher order modes so it's not that desirable but we can still increase it to uh, yeah we can still increase it a bit what about squeezing so can we go to high amount of squeezing uh, in principle yes but in practice squeezing is like limited a lot by optical loss in the system and uh, astigmatism and a lot mode mode mismatch and there are a lot of other aspects that come into play when we try to implement squeezing at uh, big interferometers so we cannot go all the way to 10 db at moment so let's keep it at say some value close to 7 but then there are like some interesting effects uh, which is purely optical so if we do something known as detuning which is uh, make the carrier signal off-resonant 
in the signal recycling cavity uh, it can be seen that the peak of our optical response can be shifted so if you, you you see the peak is now shifting to higher frequencies depending upon how i detune my detector okay so this is i think this is cool and one more thing that we can do is to play with the transmittance of our signal recycling mirror here so if i if further reduce the transmittance i can increase the resonance and the peak of this sensitivity down like it would be much more sharp and i might be able to tune the interferometer so what i'm trying to say in this hypothetical uh, situation is by playing by modeling and playing with various parameters we might be able to design detectors which might target uh, certain signals at high frequency or whatever you want so this sort of effort happens all all all, all the time to when we want to design the next generation detectors so let me stop sharing and let me i'm almost at the end uh, so let me share my slide again yes so yeah so i uh, this is what i wanted to say and i would say that it's a very interesting and exciting field and we would need both physicists and engineers to work together and make this happen and detect more of such sources and this is one photo that i took uh, in may uh, from geo and if you have any questions and thanks a lot for you can ask me thanks a lot for patiently listening to my presentation and before i take questions i would like to show this slide if you found if you if you if some of you especially students if they find this kind of work interesting and if they want to contribute or if they are looking for an opportunity to work in gravitational wave the best project to work would be to work for ligo india and this detector is currently under construction uh, and uh, yeah and it would be a great opportunity to contribute and uh, get into this field so my friend ankit from ayuka uh, shared this interesting link which has lot of resources uh, that covers various aspects of uh, gw uh, science and technology it includes tutorials data analysis video lectures uh, and internship opportunities so i would uh, yeah if you are interested please have a look at these uh, resources yeah i think i am done i can now take some questions yeah thank you um, nikhil so uh, uh, as he says uh, uh, we are not at the end but uh, we are at the beginning like uh, uh, galileo so several hundreds of years back uh, a new window has been opened to the universe um, i uh, uh, maybe you can also um, send a copy of these uh, slides to dr ram so that the link can be used uh, utilized by students uh, here so now yeah. i see one or two questions uh, post here, uh, posted here um, well one is from vaishnav krishnan uh, is it possible to feel gravitational waves um yeah so in effect it is as it is passing through every ma matter body is experiencing some amount but if you calculate it uh, we would see that it is so tiny like it would be order of 10 raised to minus 46 uh, so that you would hardly feel anything so so we are all getting stretched and squeezed but it is so tiny that we don't even feel it okay so uh, this is from the youtube i think satish is here um uh, so he asks uh, space time uh, made of uh, is space time made of cosmic strings i think this That's is uh, dr satish uh, who was a ad hoc faculty here in our institute sometime back I, so cosmic yeah so 
Einstein's as as per Einstein's theory, the space time is like a continuum. Okay, so it it has not yet been quantized. It has not been combined with quantum mechanics. So as as per his theory, if you zoom into the space, it would still look continuous. And cosmic strings, I don't know. I am not an expert in that field. <laughs> uh, so yeah, when. Yeah, I try to. It's. I I would try to look up, look it up, and then provide you with an answer. But what I know from Einstein's theory is like space time is a continuum, and it is like infinitely zoomable, and it has quantum effects or like the Planck scale effects have not been introduced or successfully. There are works on quantum gravity to combine these two, and. In the classical theory of uh, general relativity, if you understand the metric perfectly, uh, we would be able to know about the curvature. And so, okay. So here's Ashwin P. Vijayan. Um, very nice talk. Maybe I might have missed it. Does uh, radiation pressure from high-powered lasers uh, also contribute? Uh, uh, also contribute uh, to the noise? Also, is human-induced noise uh, the most difficult to model? Okay, so yeah, so I can uh, show this uh, slide again. Uh, so, so the the radiation pressure from the light is can cause motion, um, but it turns out that its effect is mainly at the lowest frequency. Okay, so in this case, it would. If we project the uh, radiation pressure noise from the light, it would it would look like this. Okay, so the photons are actually so what he is asking is like the photons are hitting the mirrors and they are imparting momentum, and that can actually and if if you have pressure imbalances, if you have a power imbalance on both sides or things like that, or if you have some dis differences in the mo the momentum that's transferred you will have um, jitter uh, and it it actually goes as 1 by f square i think uh, but it is usually it is at the lowest frequency and practically we have other sources of noise so we might already have seismic noise or control noise or uh, optic uh, coating noise uh, that it is uh, it is already higher than the amount of radiation pressure noise so once we have better um, seismic isolation and better optical coatings and we and the sensitivity of the advanced detectors come down they will sense uh, the radiation pressure noise and in fact if i am right advanced ligo and virgo are seeing signatures of radiation pressure noise and one way to counter that would be to use frequency dependent squeezing the squeezing that I told you is a frequency independent, and it's only good at high frequency, and it is actually injecting a bit of noise at the radiation pressure. So if advanced LIGO would, and they are now working on doing frequency dependent squeezing, so where both the both the ends of the spectrum would get uh, would be improved. So uh, yeah, so that's my comment about radiation pressure noise and regarding the human induced noise yes it is hard to model so one way is to locate the detector at um, far from the city so far from railway line far from airports far from mining activities and put seismic isolation uh, and uh, so mostly it is seismic uh, and so we can actually model and project. So, if you place seismometers and uh, other acceler accelerometers, we can project the noise and then get an idea. Uh, and the most uh, complicated thing to model is uh, something in the mid frequency. So, it is something from uh, something uh, from say 100 hertz to 1000 hertz. In that region, uh, after all the noise projections, scientists are still not able to match the noise budget is not matching at any of these detectors with the real thing so uh, what we do usually is to make speculations and then calculate the noise and project it and see if it if it uh, really accounts for this uh, uh, yeah the 
and uh, and until we know what is limiting us we cannot improve it further so so that's my comment mm -hmm. okay so uh, this is um, vimal vijay he is a computer science student from nit calicut he says um, since the variations are uh, 10 raised to minus 18 meter of magnitude how can we measure such tiny variation with laser of 10 raised to minus 6 uh, meter wavelength yes so that's a good question and that is uh, if that's what i tried to explain through the optical gain so what we do is uh, so I, I think i should also explain calibration so what we do is uh, ultimately what we see is like uh, difference in phase okay differential phase right and if we if you saw this slide what i what i do i if we place a short uh, photodiode and i look at the intensity fluctuations and uh, the, i take the fourier trans i take the frequency dependent intensity fluctuations coming out due to this differential phase and i look at if i look at the spectrum and if i can also know the optical gain in the system i would be able to estimate the like the displacement at each frequency so what we do usually is uh, we introduce so when the loop is running and the interferometer is locked what we do is we introduce calibration lines uh, into the controls and these are lines which are injected at known amplitude okay i precisely would know that say at one hertz i am moving my mirror by certain amount in meters okay and and then i know that I, so what i do is like at say at few points in my sensitivity say 400 hertz 700 hertz 1 kilohertz i inject these lines and then i try to move my optics and i precisely know how much i am moving in terms of meter uh, through the calibration and i look at the photodiode signal uh, which is in watts and then i can get this optical response and we can actually trace back the motion at one hertz and then we know the pendulum response and things like that so through this kind of calibration uh, frequency dependent calibration i can convert my photodiode signal in watts to uh, optical like length variation in meters and if we follow this part uh, and if we calculate we can already see that with this kind of uh, uh, differential phase measurements we can uh, reach uh, 10 raised to minus 18 and that kind of sensitivity and you, yeah i think you, you should also see that we are actually measuring uh, the optical beat between the carrier frequency and the uh, signal side bands so that's it's like yeah so that's in uh, audio band so so you can actually use a laser and through this process measure something which is smaller than the uh, wavelength of the yeah like of the laser light nikhil your, yes your laptop battery has been uh, again exhausted i think around only 10 percent yeah. <laughs> yeah i still have 11 per 11 percent so it's it should <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can... yeah there is uh, i i see there's just one more question here um, by introducing an optical element uh, in, uh, introducing an optical element increase optical path thereby increasing the sensitivity of the instrument and also decrease the length of the arms is this possible can you decrease the length of the arms to uh, increase sensitivity that's what i understand so is maybe he is asking uh, can i build tabletop yeah. interferometer 
there have been efforts to build atomic interferometers to detect gravitational waves and they are like con yeah uh, but to to see so from all these calculations we see that to if you want to observe it all depends on what frequency you want to observe so if you want to observe it in audio band 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz you would need long arm interferometers while if you want to measure gravitational waves at say millihertz uh okay so say from white dwarf binaries and uh, you can actually use tabletop you uh, it's not tabletop we yeah, you can actually use lisa which will have multiple satellites which are small but they have to be like uh, launched in space and we need like uh, long baselines to detect this stuff so let's see okay so to detect if you want to use uh, if you want to use tabletop interferometers you will be able to detect high frequency gravitational waves say above i don't know kilohertz very very high like say megahertz i think for that you might not need long baseline but for the sources that we have or you might have different techniques to uh like in the inverse gerstenstein or you you could have a different way to sense them but for the audio band which we know from astrophysics like we know there are sources that emit at this frequency uh and that's why we build it at this uh, frequency there it has to be at least um, kilometers scale okay so this is from anjali what are the effects of turning up the power ha huh, okay so let me which slide should i so okay so let me one second let me bring in this so when you increase power if you uh, it we would see that uh, if i have 3 watt coming inside and with this uh, power recycling i have 3 kilo watt and if you look at the optics it is on pass so here at this optics it's just getting reflected and if you have very nice optical coatings with high reflectivity it doesn't go into the substrate while for the beam splitter a geo it has to pass through the entire bulk of the beam splitter and what it causes is it causes uh, thermal lensing and thermal deformations and what that so that leads to optical path difference through the beams uh, 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 through the beam splitter and this is seen to introduce higher order modes in the system so if i uh, and i know that my gravitational wave carries only signal in the fundamental mode but if you do a mode scan you would see that the high it can change the refractive index so it can it's something it's called thermo refractive index it can change the thermo refractive index index and it can also cause more coating noise so coating noise uh, is one of the limiting sensitivities at the lower frequency and that can also change uh, yeah so we'll need extra optics like here the optics output mode cleaner to uh, remove the junk light or what we need to do is to project as i told you like corrective adaptive thermal radiation to uh keep the path length uh uniform and yeah one more thing like if you have point absorbers or some sort of defect or point absorbers in the bulk uh, it can damage the entire uh, optics so uh, yeah so should be also clean and very clean and we don't want particles to come and sit on this optic where we have 3 kilowatt of laser okay i see there are a lot of questions uh, which have suddenly popped up in uh, uh, youtube maybe we may not have time for all that um, i'll just take one from our uh, former student uh, krishna kumar from the first msc tech batch uh, so what do you uh think the next step from lego say 2021 uh, onwards would be towards a fundamental 
uh, uh, towards the fundamentals or data driven models uh can you repeat that question please uh, what do you think the next step from lego say 2021 onwards would be uh, towards the fundamentals or data driven models uh, is it a direction towards fundamental uh, uh, aspects or towards data driven models okay so one thing i would like to say is like okay we have detected gravitational waves but we have only detected 39 events so that's not enough statistics so what astrophysics people care is like we need to build models on like the distribution of uh, stars in the universe like at what epoch these events happened and all that so we need more events first of all so uh, the uh, currently the ligo detectors are going through an upgrade called uh, uh, called uh, yeah uh, and the idea is to now take it off offline make the upgrades and then come back with an increased sensitivity so that we improve the astrophysical reach of the sources that we can capture okay and and so that would be sort of to, to capture more source would be one aim to look for the post merger signal that i showed you before would be also it it would, it would also be great and the other thing is like we have only seen gravitational waves from binary neutron stars okay and uh, we, we do have other sources we uh, we have stochastic gravitational wave background that is exp- uh, that is uh, also uh, should be seen soon with improved sensitivity but it has not been detected uh, and there are also uh, gravitational waves emitted from continuous uh, continuous waves emitted from rotating neutron stars that have not been seen yet and there could also be unknown so it's like you know once once galileo invented his telescope he was not sure that he would see all of this object that we are still seeing through hubble and other optical telescopes so there could be a lot of unknowns uh, and yes and then what would happen is like it's also like a test bed to you know try out different technology like squeezing and quantum mechanical effects and uh, uh frequency dependent squeezing this sort of technologies would be also test- tested in the new detectors and there are also efforts to uh so the plan now is like after advanced ligo advanced virgo we would have an inter- set of detectors uh finally we would like to have the third generation detectors called einstein telescope and cosmic explorer and in between there might be uh, a stage called voyager ligo voyager which is uh, like a cryogenic version so to reduce the thermal noise and coating loss and stuff uh, people have suggested to change the optics and reduce the temperature and go for cryogenics so those things will also be uh, tested and i think coming to his other thing about data driven uh, if he meant are we going to use data science and machine learning uh, of uh, the thing is like we have hundreds of sensor thousands of sensors and 10000s of channels which are recording various aspects of this interferometer and often it takes a lot of effort and experience to understand years of experience to understand to tune this interferometers so there have been a lot of efforts with this boom in machine learning uh, to make use of all this information and try to you know like try to make smarter detectors like geo for example is a fully automatic detector so if the if there is seismic or if the seismic goes down uh, geo will try to automatically lock and go to each stage of the locking so but we would like to further add intelligence and data science uh, would play major role in uh, that part okay so i um i see there are uh, few more questions there but uh, as we are uh, uh, really extending into a, a long session so let's uh, so i'll uh, maybe ask ram to uh, somehow send these uh, uh, things to uh, nikhil to answer and uh, through email or something and uh, let's uh, wind up now it's been a wonderful talk here uh, 
thank you nikhil and i'll just hand over to ram to uh, complete the session okay uh, thank you uh, raghu sir for chairing the uh, webinar session so well i thanks again dr uh, nikhil for delivering such a wonderful and informative talk on transforming a michelson interferometer into a gravitational uh, wave detector i hope our audience have learned uh, a lot from your talk i have personally learned several things from your talk uh, you answered doubts of our uh, audience uh, so nicely uh, yeah thank you all uh, for your participations and wonderful questions so the event is now closed yeah thank you thank you nikhil so let's um, meet sometime and uh, all the best yeah sure we should i will uh, i'll talk to these guys and we can arrange yeah we will we will so again so uh, hosting this uh, <laughs> nice event yeah. <laughs> i hope yeah. sir, it went well <laughs> it certainly did okay yeah. so there are a lot of questions on the youtube <laughs> So yeah so we we yeah. should think of some way to uh, so if you yeah so i can i can frame answers uh but it's it's not very clear how to respond to them because their email ids will not be uh there perhaps in the description of the youtube video you can add this answers yeah i think give comments or as comments we can yeah. add as comments yeah yeah, yeah we can add as comments right. i think it can be as comments yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So. So right. yeah. So yeah. We can. Uh, we can in fact call our other friends also, right? Sure. We have all the guys uh, waiting to give nice talks. They are all doing different, different. Yes. Subjects. Yes. Uh, let's uh, maybe uh, look at Shantanu, uh, who is doing some neutron diffraction, and uh, uh, others. Uh, Say Sachin, who has looked at soft matter. Uh, so there's a yeah. lot of options, and uh, there are other batch EP students also. Let's uh, 